welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel uh, discussions uh, for on future of geothermal energy. We have excellent team of panelists over here and includes uh, Dr. Horn, Dr. Levesco, Dr. Ball and Dr. Petit. Uh, and what I'm gonna do over here is that for the sake of time, et cetera, I'm gonna have everybody introduce themselves uh, uh, for a couple of, uh, using a couple of sentences or so. I'll start right away with myself. I'm gonna go with this order over here. Uh, I'm Daryl Dindoruk. I'm a full-time faculty professor at University of Houston and Petroleum Engineering and Chemical Engineering Department as well. And uh, I used to work for Shell. I was the chief scientist of reservoir physics. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Horn. So good morning, everybody. My name is Roland Horn. I'm a professor of energy science and engineering at Stanford University and also director of the Stanford Geothermal Program. So actually, I did my PhD in geothermal energy about 50 years ago, and I'm originally from New Zealand. So I've been working in geothermal a long time, although over the 50 years between that time and now, I've also kind of become a petroleum engineer as well. So I, I was the chairman of the petroleum engineering department at Stanford until we changed. Um, and at one time, I was also the president of the International Geothermal Association. And Dr. Levesco? Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm uh, currently I'm a faculty at the uh, uh, University of Texas at uh, Austin uh, in the Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering Department. I joined uh, last September, and before that, I um, uh, I was the chief scientist for the pressure pumping uh, product line at Baker Hughes. Um, hi, Will. Um, and, and so in addition to that, I'm, I'm the SP uh, technical director for the data science and engineering analytics. Um, and uh, uh, my, my expertise is, is truly in, um, in well construction and, and uh, everything that happens after, after the well is drilling. Um, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm also involved on several other things in SPE and now I'm actually happy to talk about how many um, efforts are happening in SPE um, related to geothermal. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, Dr. Ball, Philip Ball. Good morning. Um, I'm Philip Ball. I'm the uh, Chief of Geothermal Innovation at uh, Clean Air Task Force. Clean Air Task Force is a, a non-profit um, environmental kind of advisory or advocacy. Um, and we have started a team this year called the Super Hot Rock uh, team, and we are advocating for the high temp temperature, high pressure, uh, supercritical phase of geothermal uh, power production. Um, prior to uh, joining CATF, uh, I was a, a, a regional specialist at Total Energies, uh, and I spent um, the best part of the last 20 years uh, in oil and gas working in frontier basins. And um, since about 2018, uh, I've been a convert to geothermal energy, uh, and that is what I now do uh, full time at CATF. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pettit. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, Will Pettit, I'm the global geothermal lead for Baker Hughes. Um, I've been in consulting and geothermal for the last 25 years, which is uh, about half as long as Roland Horn, but um, still feels a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, I work obviously for Baker. Uh, we're a global energy technologies company, um, about $30 billion in size, 80,000 people. Um, I lead the reservoir technology sites, so everything to do with reservoir design, characterization, um, optimization, all that kind of lovely stuff. Um, been in, as I say, consulting for 25 years in micro seismics, geomechanics, rock mechanics. And, uh, the last four years mm -hmm. I've been executive director for geothermal rising, um, left there earlier in the summer to join Baker. Good to meet everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Did I leave anybody else? Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, almost people are going to think that we prepared this Dr. Horn. I know 38 out of 50 years of his because I did my undergrad thesis in geothermal. And you can probably recognize two faces <clears throat> from 1989. Uh, happens to be me and Dr. Horn. I, some classes from him, many classes. Thank you. Uh, anyway, little um, blast from the past, so as to speak. Okay, so I'm going to 
start the panel over here. Um, first uh, question that I really wonder uh, what uh, you experts think about, uh, that is uh, what would be the first new area and applications that we will see an impact of ge geothermal in current state of affairs? Because as Dr. Horn already said, and all of you know that it has been around for some time. Um, I'll start, I guess, um, with Ignite this thing with Dr. Horn and we'll go with that and we'll scramble any way we want. Thank you. Okay, good. So uh, can you sh stop sharing your screen? Oh, yes, Here, I will. Please? Sorry about so, that. so there's a lot of um, new things taking place in geothermal right now and have for the last 10 years or so. Geothermal has been on an upward swing uh, in that recent decade. Um, I think what's new now is the interest that the oil industry is taking in geothermal. Of course, the oil and oil and gas industry has been working in geothermal for you know a longer time than I've been around. The largest geothermal company in the world was Chevron for most of the last 40 years. However, the additional interest that's uh, now taking place kind of in the industry in general means that there's innovations taking place in drilling, for example, and drilling methodology. And, and that's going to give rise to faster drilling, cheaper drilling, and that I think is going to make geothermal more accessible. There's a lot of kind of, um, uh, how can I describe them, sort of uh, uh, out there ideas that are also being promulgated for geothermal, um, most of which have actually been thought about many times before and most of which actually don't make thermodynamic sense. So there's a little bit of irrational exuberance taking place at the same time as a, well of, a lot of very sensible innovation and a lot of sensible crossover from oil and gas technology into geothermal. So there's, there's kind of a mix taking place. But overall, the forward path is uh, very promising, especially in the context of drilling technology migrating from shale gas, shale oil into geothermal. And I think that will result in a lowering of price. It'll result in... Um, greater uh, likelihood of success in enhanced geothermal systems or EGS. For example, making use of horizontal wells with multi-stage fracturing, super common in the oil industry now, but the first such well has just been drilled for geothermal in uh, Nevada in the last, in fact, in this year, earlier this year. So that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, great point. It leads to a lot of other questions, but I'm going to stay on this one for the uh, other panelists over here for now. Uh, I'll, I'll just go the way they appear on my screen right now. Uh, uh, Dr. Pittit, can you say a yeah. couple of things? <clears throat> yeah. Um, just building on Roland, I, I, I agree with everything that, that Roland just, just said. And um, I think that the the, the kind of focus of the applications will be very geographically dependent um, because I think you've got to look at this uh, as of geothermal as this kind of holistic view of, you know, it's, it's power and heat. So you're looking at, you know, a whole spectrum of different technologies that can be applied to geothermal. And I, I won't go into them now, but, um, you know, we'll probably touch on them as we go through these, these conversations over the next 40 minutes or so. But, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a whole spectrum of technologies that get applied to power and heat and at different, different scales at different um, depths. So you start off with the super hot, super deep stuff um, all the way through to, you know, a heat pump on your, on your home, just, just buried under your garden. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of technology there and that will be applied in different areas, depending on different markets and uh, different demands. So you look at the U S for instance, right now, um, the traditional hydrothermal geothermal industry has done a great, fantastic job over the last 50 years of, of developing a, um, a somewhat niche, uh, but very successful industry on the, the west coast of, of the US that we have to scale up and expand across across the nation. Um, we aren't so good in this country at developing heat um, for various reasons. Um, and when I say heat, I'm talking about um, community, um, district heating and industrial heating. But when you look at Europe, 
And uh, Europe, the market is dominated right now by, by heating projects. Um, for instance, you take Munich. Munich is doing a fantastic job. They're doing heating projects that will be supplying heating for hundreds of thousands of homes in, in just one city. So when you look at the, the geothermal industry as we develop and we scale up and we uh, expand the industry, then there'll be very, a lot of opportunities geographically spread across a, a wide spectrum of different technologies. Great points uh, and uh, compliments the previous ones. Uh, uh, Philip, Philip Tuckerball. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, I agree with both Roland and um, Will. Um, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot, they both introduce a lot of concepts. Um, from the CATF position, though, I think uh, I'd be. It, I mean, we'd love to see that as a new emerging area. That that being super hot rock uh, development. So, really, um, that's probably a form of EGS, but just deeper and hotter. Um, you know, that's kind of what we're advocating for. It's not really a moonshot. I think we can drill into these rocks, but there are certain aspects that need to be. Uh, tweaked and improved upon um, from you know, the well integrity, the, the reservoir creation and management uh, if we're fracturing at these high pressures and high temperatures. And there's, um, you know, that so sort of getting successful demonstrations and the demonstration of uh, being able to produce a supercritical fluid and producing power from that fluid. I mean, that's what, what we are advocating for on a, on a daily basis globally. And so um, that would be terrific. Now, um, I think that's a few years away uh, from reality. And I, what I'm I'm very excited about across the industry is the uh, increased uptake of geothermal technologies. So from the lower level, even including ground source heat pumps through to um, district heating, uh, which is, as Will mentioned, is huge in Europe right now. Um, and then, of course, with the recent bill, um, you know, en energy thermal networks, I think I've got that right, uh, thermal energy networks in New York um, have been passed. And so there's, we might see a number of projects coming forward whereby geothermal is integrated uh, into inter-district heating systems. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really dynamic and exciting time. And um, it's the innovation that's taking place across the industry, Roland hinted at that is really exciting and, and seeing increased crossover from oil and gas technologies that make sense into geothermal, uh, which drive uh, competitiveness and cost reductions, um, that's going to make a big impact. So it's, in, it's a very exciting time. Great. Thank you. Silvio, Dr. Livesco. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dindorok. So excellent point so far. I, 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 I'm, I feel very happy to hear, you know, so many different points of view that actually converge into the same direction, right? Um, I feel the times are excellent right now for geothermal, really exciting actually times. I do agree that it's a lot of excitement that is not really tuned with the current technologies from oil and gas and, and the current innovation, you know, models. And probably that's why we need to focus. So, um, you know, everybody's excited. Everybody wants actually to take the current technologies from oil and gas and just apply them to geothermal. Um, but, but geothermal is not only one market or only one technology. So we, we need actually to start differentiating between direct heat applications for, you know, uh, single family homes and large buildings and district heating and then power generation in Nevada and power generation in Indonesia and, and and all these things right because no one technology is going to fit all problems with geothermal and so i think um if we want to scale it up we need actually to define different markets different problems and solve them individually right now actually um the elephant in the room is that there is not enough funding for scaling up geothermal to a global scale we are still experimenting we are still you know applying technologies we are still taking technologies from oil and gas and trying to um, to repurpose them for, for geothermal, you know, um, energy uh, applications. And so with coming from the oil and gas, spending, you know, my entire industry career in oil and gas in related to innovation and R&D and, and field deployment, um, I understand that the oil and gas industry is really 
optimized to think about return on investment and fast. Meaning that we put our our you know uh, investments in in R and D in technology development in whatever brings us return on investment right away this year next year at most right and so with that mindset actually we we actually we we kind of block ourselves in 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 scaling up faster and so I'm making the same plea that I make at ATC last month saying that um, instead of all of us competing on a small pie what we really need is to make the pie bigger and so by that what what it means is we will bring more funding by all of us collaborating together and i'm happy to to explore that further down the line thank you great uh, great point uh, you put yourself on the spot because i'm going to scan backwards over here so you're going to be uh, the first for the next question dr levesco but i'm going to Summarize a couple of points over here that I jot down here. So there'll be segue to other things. I heard the common points over here, accessibility or wider spectrum of accessibility, tech transfer from ENP, like drilling, et cetera, Dr. Horn, and number of you said already, and also super hot rock, deeper and hotter. And of course, there are technical hurdles over here and various aspects of flus. And also one of the things that directly or indirectly what I heard is reduction uh, cost reduction and competitiveness, and of course, uh, getting the money fast. They all are interrelated. Now, uh, it's um, now it's going to be relate relating to the following questions. Uh, what are the biggest obstacles? Why we are not doing? What is the impediment to entry over here? If there is an issue like that, is it like an impediment or or obstacle uh, or barrier to entry, or is it more incremental actually? And what do you think, Dr. Levesco? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll can, start. Anytime, sorry, anytime if you want to think more, you can transfer it to your friend, actually. You can put each other <laughs> to a difficult situation. You have the cards. <laughs> um, well, so let's let's build up a little bit of, you know, uh, let me build up a little bit on my preview comments. So um, um, I, I agree that the geothermal industry, the current geothermal industry is quite niche. Uh, is very uh, good at, at what they know to do, right? But but how we scale that up? And so our expectation is that we we take the current technologies from oil and gas and we apply to the current geothermal, you know, industry, and then we are going to have geothermal in, anywhere, right? Um, I'm 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 unfortunately I have to you know break the party here to say that probably that's not the case because I mean we tried you know different types of geothermal you know other technologies over the years over the last decades actually and and we still don't have a current you know commercial project um, that is we can we can take it anywhere in the world right um, out of California Nevada and so on and so what that means is actually we do need to come up with new technologies and new business model. Uh, probably, first of all, we have to define the business model that we want to take out of you know, the current geothermal industry and figure out actually how we can scale up that. Um, the other part is if we want actually to come up with a technology that will scale up geothermal you know, industry, um, that means more funding. And so the oil and gas industry over the last you know, decade with so many downturns and so many you know, transformations, they are really used to have money put into new R&D projects and have a close to 100% success rate, right? So there is no room for failure. And so if you look around in the history of innovation, that's not how really innovation works, right? You have to fail, you have to fail fast to learn from your mistakes and move on. Um, that's not really happening right now in oil and gas or in the geothermal industry. And so probably we need first to figure out how to embrace that model and how to find funding for SEDA, right? And so once we have many more companies, many more people um, looking into where the opportunities are to scale up geothermal, probably that's the way to go in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll go random now. So who wants to pick it up from this? I, I might chime in there. So I, I agree with that fully. But part of the difficulty, you know, as I said earlier, 
you know, the concept of taking oil and gas technology and moving it directly into geothermal uh, is, is at first glance what people look forward to doing. However, as I mentioned before, oil companies have been involved in geothermal since the outset in the 1970s. They've been around for a very long time. And so none of the technology in oil and gas is unknown to, to the geothermal industry, uh, a big fraction of which is already oil and gas operated. Uh, what is new uh, is sort of the application of some of the technology. And the difficulty, as uh, Sylvia said, is actually the the fact that there's such a small number of projects. I mean, we do have global scale geothermal in places. There are some countries that have as much as 60% of their energy from geothermal. California has 6%. Nevada has 10%. I mean, it's a very significant input. Um, however, overall, worldwide, there's a small number of projects. We talk about enhanced geothermal systems, which I think really is the future, uh, deep, hot, and, and also not so hot. There have been a total of about 40 or 50 EGS projects in the world. The total number of EGS wells perhaps is fewer than 100. And if you compare that to shale oil and shale gas development in the US over the last 20 years, I don't know how many wells there are, but hundreds of thousands. And if you also look at the development of success in shale oil and shale gas, what you can see is kind of incremental change over time. People in the drilling of those hundreds of thousands of wells learn how to do it better. The wells that are drilled on a kind of a factory scale today um, you know, five times more productive than they were 15, 16 years ago. So what it takes to get geothermal moving forward like that is just simply numbers of projects. And as Sylvia so correctly said, that needs money, money, quite a lot of money. Mm -hmm. What we require is the venture capital model. You know, you, you have 10 projects, uh, eight of them may fail, although you learn a lot in a process. Uh, and two of them make money if that's the first 10. And then we go forward to the second, third. And by the time you get to the 10th, 10, nine out of 10 of them are successful. And that's the path we need to follow. Thank you. Who would like to be next uh, on this question? Yeah, I, I I completely agree. And, you know, this is the this is why having a great panel like this put together is, really works because <laughs> everybody, everybody really, you know, is aligned um, on all the challenges and, and, and all the opportunities. But um, I think a lot of a lot of what we need to be doing in the in the geothermal industry is de-risking. Um, and that's kind of really kind of the, the kind of the. The hidden elephant in the room, if you like, behind Roland's original comments about, um, you know, drilling and, and making drilling more e efficient and effective, um, you know, the same for exploration, the um, characterization, um, you know, the same for a lot of these new technologies that are coming, coming on board, um, EGS. It's all about trying to de-risk those technologies, de-risk um, individual projects so that we can encourage investment that that kind of venture capital type model of of investors coming in and and putting in their money to 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 see these projects get off the ground um, effectively we need to be de-risking these these projects so that takes new methodologies new technologies new workflows um, in order to to kind of um, uh, evaluate those um, projects, assess them, make sure that we can take as much risk out of those as possible. Um, it takes new funding mechanisms, um, new policies, um, kind of being thrown at thrown at the whole the whole gamut of these things that can then you know encourage investors into the market and and putting projects on the map. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rabol. Yeah, um, some interesting points made there. Um, I think, well, there, there are clearly some obstacles sort of that are um, around permitting and, and legislative aspects. Um, uh, I'm about to get interrupted. Um, <laughs> I'll beg your pardon. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just switch off and come back. So um, uh, That's okay. That's totally understandable. Uh, apologies. apologies. Um, Thank you. <laughs> 
no, that's, it's never that's, a good time. It's, it's, it's life. Excellent. I totally, I totally understand. Um, what I'm going to just uh, summarize this a little bit. What I'm going to do right now is that let me just uh, put a couple of remarks what I gather around uh, so that we can anchor ourselves. Then I'm going to pick a question. I'll give a little heads up to Dr. Algarthi Ahmed uh, to pick a question from the audience or virtual audience. Uh, what I uh, what I can put together from this thing is that there are a lot of commonalities uh, between uh, pretty much all of you. It leads to like some kind of an ecosystem generation over here. I guess cash or money or capital is the main lubricant against the frictional effects. I'm just going to put it that way. And of course, these effects could be understanding it or uh, lower return on investment. As we don't, as we do more and more, we learn more. Of course, so that's the, again the, uh, leading to the same thing. Of course, once uh, government, etc., entities see more uh, projects, they are going to be easier, hopefully. And uh, also the um, business model. I hear a lot of things about the business model. I think uh, the profitability it needs to be probably or competitiveness needs to be um, evaluated in a different way. And scale up was also brought up. But when I put them all together, again, uh, it's related to this enabling uh, environment, so as to speak. Um, so that, yes. Viral, if, I, if I may uh, just sure. complete what I was trying to say uh, quickly. Um, I think traditionally there's been some um, legislative issues and, and permitting issues which have impacted the financial um, uh, you know, bottom line of geothermal projects. If you can't get your wells permitted and drilled uh, and then your pilots uh, proven up, you, it's very hard to move a cost-effective way towards a, a power plant. So removing some of the legislative obstacles uh, I think is a primary way of helping geothermal projects go forward. But um, I think a couple of people mentioned money. Um, you know, geothermal does need investment. And I don't think it's just from the venture capitalists. Uh, government intervention, I think, is critical. Um, you know, hydrogen, nuclear, carbon capture get obscene amounts of money for technology development. And most of them don't even have a viable industry. I think geothermal is a viable uh, technology. And it gets a pittance compared to to those other technologies mentioned. So, if we were getting the billions of dollars that uh, hydrogen or carbon capture and sequestration were getting, I think geothermal would be significantly advanced. And then um, the other key point I wanted to pick up on was scalability, um, and that's one of the attractions of uh, the super hot rock and some of the drilling technologies that are emerging. Is that they, if we can demonstrate. Uh, scalability, um, both in size of power plant, but also you can build it up not just in niche areas, where, which is what traditionally people consider hampers the hydrothermal, geothermal aspect. Um, and I think the EGS projects and or super hot projects and or closed loop projects that we're seeing emerge um, really increase the scalability of geothermal. And, and that accessibility is critical, I think, to its future success. Okay, so the um, what I'm going to do is that uh, I did not hear from Ahmed right now because I need to read the others, so I don't want to waste time. Uh, I, I, I uh, there was okay, excellent. Ready. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. excellent. Sorry, excellent. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, many of the students uh, they get the feeling whenever you uh, many experts talk about uh, renewable energy, such as the geothermal, they get the feeling that oil and gas business is dying. So can you comment on that? Yeah, how it competes. Um, I, I can start. Uh, I can start. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a really great question, but, but uh, the answer is very simple. In my opinion, I think they are completely separate, you know, industries. Um, the future geothermal industry that's going to emerge uh, is going to be completely independent of the oil and gas industry, and they are not really competing um, uh, energy output wise. Um, they may compete in terms of people, in terms of you know people's skills, uh, because because 
both of them are dealing with subsurface engineering and because of that probably they are going to compete uh, compete for the same you know type of engineers but apart from that um in my opinion they are going to be completely different uh, industries and and so when i'm saying that is because of you cannot just take the business model from the oil and gas and apply it to the geothermal industry i think that's um everybody can agree on that and then in terms of technologies yes uh, probably there is going to be technology transfer but that's that's actually a, a benefit right because we are going to make the pie bigger so <laughs> no don't worry about that i i don't think there is any any need uh, you know to to worry about competition between oil and gas and geothermal thank, thank you. you uh will <laughs> yeah i was just going to um yeah. to add um the you know, I think I think if we go really big picture here, um, um, you know, one of the obviously the big reason why um, geothermal industry is um, uh, uh, such a, a big talking point right now um, and is expanding and, you know, we're moving things forward now like we've never done before um, is is because of really you know, two major things. First is decarbonization, which is um, uh, due to um, the biggest existential threat that uh, mankind has really ever faced, um, which is is climate change. Uh, and the second is energy security um, and stability. So, and you can look at you know different pieces of the global geopolitical situations and and those two factors play a huge role in in where geothermal where geothermal is now in, in the picture of things geothermal plays um it's it's you know it's at least for me the holy grail for for energy in terms of um having a, a large scale potential energy that can um contribute to decarbonization um, and then when you look at how geothermal can be applied on the local and um, regional scale um, independently then you've got something that um, really plays a huge role in the energy security side and stability playing you know um, that factor into the grid into the power grid providing constant heating so forth and so forth so there's huge adv um, advantages to, to geothermal energy. Now, does that mean that geothermal energy is going to, to be the only energy source in the future? No, you know, we need a, we need a mix of energy sources and oil and gas will, will never be eliminated from, from our um, society. Um, but as we, ha we have to change, we have to treat um, uh, decarbonization um, effectively, we have to um, look at um, climate change, and we we have to deal with these issues. And so, we're going to need to um, have technologies like geothermal energy in that mix and playing a large role. I wanted to build on some of Will's comments, um, Viral, um, mm -hmm. you know, and to the question: uh, uh, oil and gas will not go away. Uh, I agree. Um, you know, we need as much energy as we can get. And it's not just one technology that will see us forward. So as Will said, it's going to be every technology that we can get our hands on. Um, and, and part of the problem is that um, with global warming, the amount of energy that we're going to need to cool our homes is going to increase. And it's going to increase um, you know, 20 percent, 14. I think I did some statistics on this for the mega cities around the world. Uh, today and based on a 1.5 or 3.0 increase, we're looking at 14 to 22 percent increase just in base energy needs to run our mega cities. So amplify that globally. The amount of energy we're going to need as global warming kicks in, um, how are we going to make that up? I mean, the oil and gas industry is already struggling to keep oil and gas at affordable rates today, um, and you could say that's a lack of investment in in uh, exploring, but we're already quite well explored as an industry. Um, so in order to even just to stay status quo as energy, as uh, energy demand goes up due to global warming, we're going to have to find technologies that provide us with heating and cooling uh, options and power options. And geothermal is one of those. 
And so to think that oil and gas will go away, it's just not. But the geothermal is a technology that we, we quite rapidly need to, to bring on board. Thank you. Okay, there is a second question uh, about depleted wells and depleted reservoirs. Is it possible to be used in uh, geothermal applications? Let me chime in on that one. So yeah. the idea of using old oil and gas wells for geothermal has also been around for some time and actually has been deployed in commercial levels uh, in a few places already. Uh, there was a project in Wyoming in Teapot Dome um, probably 15 years ago and two projects at least in oil fields in China where they were using relatively hot uh, water from oil field water to generate electricity. So it is possible. Um, however, it's also a question of scale. One of the big um, misunderstandings between the two industries, oil and gas and geothermal, is the scale of the actual production itself. So a, a reasonable geothermal well produces about 50,000 barrels a day of hot water in order to be commercial and less than that is sub-commercial. So we can take use of oil and gas wells. However, the, the ability to get the amount of fluid that you need, geothermal fluid, out of a warm or hot oil and gas field is strictly limited. You know, uh, a very, very good oil well produces a thousand barrels a day, which is two orders of magnitude smaller than is required. So it certainly can be usefully applied um, and there are some good examples where it could be done and is or will be done. For example, if you have an old oil field close to a small town, you could use it for district heating or something like that. Um, so it is a useful thing to do, but it's not as it's not going to be as big a thing as some people imagine. I think the biggest advantage in terms of kind of old oil and gas fields is not actually the wells and the infrastructure themselves, but the knowledge, how much is known about the subsurface actually provides a lot of uh, information and data that de-risks what is commonly an expense in geothermal, which is exploration. So we know so much about old ore fields, um, we can take advantage of that data and develop them for geothermal way, but probably putting in new infrastructure because the, the existing oil wells are not sufficient to provide enough fluid that we need in geothermal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody wants to add on this? Um, yeah, I think okay. um, I can add a little bit, Rol. Um, sure. having, having looked at this uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a former life, um, oil and gas wells are not always optimally located for geothermal projects, not just from the uh, you know, infrastructure, the size of the borehole, the amount of fluid that they can circulate, but the, the sort of the spatial location of the oil and gas field versus the, the thermal anomaly. So um, there will be some that are optimally, optimally located, but in many cases, we might find that um, using the knowledge of the existing experience from drilling, we can leverage that to, to locate uh, geothermal resources either deeper than the oil and gas field or adjacent to, uh, depending on the spatial location of where the thermal anomalies or where the water, the hydrothermal systems are, are upwelling. So I think the critical point is there that, that Roland made is, is utilizing the knowledge that we had from drilling those wells that can make the geothermal, subsequent geothermal projects a lot cheaper because we already know what to expect in the subsurface. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, yeah, I think I think Thank just you. to add as yeah, just to add something too. Um, and it, again, it goes back to something that Roland uh, mentioned earlier on about technologies. Um, you know, the oil and gas industry, it, it's it's infrastructure and technologies in many different ways, right? As well as people, you know, the people uh, um, in the oil and gas industry with their knowledge and expertise can play a big role in, in um, transferring over to the geothermal industry as it expands. Um, but when you look at technologies, you know, a major challenge is, is just taking those technologies that are typical in the oil and gas industry, um, you know, wireline technologies, um, 
uh, borehole characterization, logging, um, that kind of thing, and taking them to higher temperatures, zonal isolation, um, you know, high temperature, um, high temperature tools in the well for for um, zonal isolation. The you know these these things um, need a lot of research and development. They um, they have maximum temperatures now and that are that have found that level purely because the oil and gas industry doesn't operate above that temperature um, typically. Um, now we need to take those technologies and expand them to um, to the to those higher temperatures. And a lot of that work is being, um, you know, research and development done with um, Department of Energy money at Forge, for instance, um, doing a great job there. But we really need to. Uh, it goes back to again something that Philip mentioned earlier on is is you know we need more more investment um, on that side of things. If we were getting those billions that were going to hydrogen. I think what we could do to to really advance those technologies so that they could be used at um, at greater depths and, and and greater temperatures. Thank you, Silvio. Dr. Livesco, anything else to add? Yeah, yeah. One more thing. So great comment so far. Um, I I agree that you know um, most of the oil and gas wells probably are not going to be useful for geothermal production as we know it today, uh, or as we expect it today. Um, however, um, I, I think that there's a huge opportunity because most of the operators did or have looked already at, you know, converting their oil and gas assets to, to geothermal energy production, whatever that means. Um, however, we don't hear that much about that, right? So everybody is doing in their own yard, you know, uh, quietly. Um, and and then I know all of us know different companies doing that, but there is no actually knowledge sharing. And so that's, you know, it's in, in the oil and gas business, you know very well that, you know, the companies consider all this, you know, knowledge transfer as, as you know, the asset. And so they they don't really compete against each other, actually, if if we go back to my previous comment about making the pie bigger instead of you know um, competing of, of a small piece of pie, that's actually what holds us back. It's it's exactly that, right? So if the oil and gas industry is looking at the equivalent oil and gas wells for converting them to geothermal energy production, um, and it doesn't work, why we don't share that lesson for everybody to to learn from it, right? And and move on. Um, we are still talking about something that probably. Some companies move on already, um, but some didn't don't know about, right? Um, and so that's a lesson, in my opinion, that we need to to take home and to think about it and find a solution for it. How the oil and gas industry critically can 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 collaborate and and can can work together to scale up geothermal in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. I wanted to add, uh, Birol, um, sure. just to a couple of comments. Um, Roland mentioned uh, Wyoming and, and China. Um, and there, there are a number of other projects that are looking at converting oil and gas. Um, there's one about to kick off in the UK um, with Sarah Fai. Uh, they got some government funding to, to move forward with the project there. Um, in Canada, you've got the Razor Energy uh, oil and gas. Uh, they're actually, I think, quite successful. So it's one of the success cases of taking an oil and gas well uh, and, and turning it into a geothermal co-production. Um, I believe Sage Geosystems in Texas have reused an oil and gas well where, where hot water was found. Um, I, think, I think they might have uh, modified it from an engineering perspective. Um, there's company in France that have looked at converting oil and gas well, and then of course in Colombia. Um, and, and forgive me for not quite remembering the names of the companies. And then Transitional Energies in uh, in in Colorado here in the US. Um, so there are a number of people doing it, uh, and I think building on Silvio's comments, uh, the knowledge sharing will be critical moving forward. And, you know, I'd love to see um, different oil and gas companies present some of their data and their assumptions in the, the models that they used uh, as well, because I think there is an inherited bias sometimes um, whereby we, we, we make incorrect assumptions when we do some of these models. And I wonder if, you know, through a learning process, we could uncover some of those biases now. Um, yeah, that's me a little bit arm waving because I think it does come back to that. We need that communication, that little bit of sharing of experience. But um, until we share data and share some of our modeling assumptions, 
it's not necessarily that we're comparing apples with apples and and um <clears throat> we might be missing some really good opportunities so a little bit speculative in my comment there but i just wanted to make that clear that there are lots of projects occurring around the world and it would be great that we capture those learnings mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, what I can tell uh, from the com commonalities over here is that knowledge, knowledge sharing, and in a way, not more of an asset, uh, sunken cost, not more of an asset than more of the knowledge itself, how we can transfer knowledge from oil and it, as well as the data. And uh, again, uh, we want to learn good and bad as well. We want to learn each other, from each other's mistakes. Generally, those are the ones that are not published. People write the positive things, not the negative things. I think it's a one-sided bias overall, um, not only for this particular industry. So I'm gonna, uh, I have a couple of questions that we have about 15 minutes. Um, I have a couple of things that I wanna hit actually. I'm really curious about your thought process on those uh, and opinion and how you see the future, especially. Uh, it's gonna be a couple of questions over here. One of them is the uh, the couple of questions is this. Um, what are the prospects for so-called closed loop geothermal? And also would the fluid system or cycle, thermal cycle make mistake? Are we leaving money on the table because of the way we implement? And what would be the prospects for closed loop? Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Horn, on this one. Okay, so I, I, um, I made reference in my opening remarks to irrational exuberance. And uh, actually, I was thinking at the time about closed loop. So the, the, the ideas of closed loop have actually been around for a very long time. Um, we had companies attempting to develop closed loop systems in the 1980s, early 1980s. And there's been at least three of them built, to my knowledge. The challenge in closed loop is the fact that it depends on conduction only. That's what closed loop means. And conduction really is an insufficient energy transfer mechanism to get a lot of energy uh, through a small space, which is a single well. That makes it very challenging from the point of view of electricity production. Um, it does have some good opportunities for uh, district heating where we don't need as much energy to be produced. Um, so keeping a system running long enough to actually make money from it is the challenge with closed loop. And most of the, the companies that have sort of started in the closed loop direction have kind of opened their loops. So realizing that it requires fluid to actually pass out into the formation, come back again, um, is actually a direction that many of them are now taking, which is is actually something which does make good thermodynamic sense. In terms of uh, alternative fluids, I, I should probably let somebody else answer that, although I do have a comment if you need it. Okay, thank you very much. I'll go backwards with Silvio now. Um, yeah, sure. We, we have uh, only two minutes left, so I, I want to be short here. Uh, I, I agree with everything Roland said. Um, I, I definitely feel that we need small wins, right? Because we keep talking about a closed loop or, um, you know, uh, how inefficient they are. And, and, and rightfully, you know, there are plenty of, of papers showing that they cannot be economical for power generation. But also there are many, many papers and actually projects showing that closed loops are... are, are uh, you know, are, are, are good for, for direct heat applications. And so, again, this brings me to the initial comment I made that, you know, when we talk about geothermal, it doesn't mean only power generation. There are market-specific problems in different technologies. And, and so closed loop probably is, you know, we should, we should just uh, look at it for direct heat applications instead of power generation. But this, by all means, can be, you know, can be part of that innovating, failing, and, and learning from it uh, kind of cycle. Any last minute thoughts from uh, uh, Dr. Petit? And yeah, I, um, uh, as, as you know, it's in the, in the public domain, Baker Hughes has invested in, in green fire um, technologies, uh, which is a um, closed loop um, provider. Um, and I have an open mind. Um, and uh, I agree with Roland on, on 
what what he's saying um, when you look at purely conduction. But uh, what I'm seeing is um, the ability to use these technologies in in different applications um, simply to make make things more efficient, more effective. Um, and and I'm seeing you know demonstrations of those those technologies and and seeing you know the results coming back and uh, both as well as as modeling and uh, demonstrations in the field. So there are, I think, um, good applications of closed loop technologies that um, that we'll see kind of coming through and and making it into the mainstream. Um, again, it's a, it's going to be a wide spectrum of technologies that. Uh, make geothermal geothermal um, successful, and and uh, applying those technologies will be will be uh, will be good to see. Now, uh, there's other forms of closed loop like Ever that are coming at it from a different from a different perspective, where you know they're looking at um, drilling long um, wells, um, large um, deviated long wells in in arrays. Um, and using pure closed loop conductive technologies. Um, and they're looking at, you know, bringing down the, the cost of those, those long, those long wells. And, you know, um, that's another, you know, viable solution, but um, we'll see how that develops over the next few years. Thank you, Dr. Pettit. I, as you, a Dr. moderator, I have to cut it. I will give only one sentence to Dr. Bola over <laughs> here. Anything to add? I'm going to share because I'm getting my <laughs> warnings over here. Thank you. <laughs> it's excellent, actually. It's not boring. Let me put it this way. Thank you. Uh, Philip, anything? The last minute? Uh, 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 last closing. I think the closed loops offer a really interesting technology, uh, and I'm, I'm very keen to see how they work, either with water and or carbon dioxide as the working fluid. Uh, and I think there's a lot of working fluid research that is, needs to be unlocked. And that's, um, I think there's a lot of exciting work to come. Excellent. I mean, this is definitely one of the best uh, uh, moderatorship that I've done. Thank you very much for excellent talks over here. Definitely, I was not bored, actually. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. That Thank was you, everybody. Great, that was a great panel. Thank you so much.